This is episode 30 of the So What podcast. 7 a.m. Done this 30 times already. I guess we're halfway to 60. Not that 60 is significant anyway. Both Hack and I have had sub four hours of sleep or something like that. <laughs> I was thinking we could like bump this podcast up two hours and then call it the 5 a.m. podcast. Oh, that's an idea. But then that would just be obnoxious in terms of how yeah. early we'd have to get up. Yeah, that would be super obnoxious. We can do one. We should do one test, though, like in the spirit of experimentation. It'd just be fun to have a test. Yeah. You want to do next week? We get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could. Yeah. Oh uh, um, yes. Let's get into let's get, let's get into the five AM topic. Cause we just did the five AM thing. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so this week, uh the weekly challenge, it wasn't it was actually a one day challenge. Uh Steven said that we should just try to wake up at five AM on Sunday because I've never gotten up that early in my life before. And so I did it. And um I guess we're just here to talk about how, how it went. Um did you want to go first or you want me to talk about my experience? You go first. You go first. It was actually interesting. Okay, so I knew that because I had never gotten up at 5 a.m. before, I, like, had to kind of prepare for it. So I think it had to be – had been absurdly early for me. Um, I mean, 5 a.m. is absurdly early for anybody. But if it was, like, let's say 7 a.m. or even 6 a.m., I could probably be like, you know, I could probably just get six hours of sleep and go to sleep at, you know – uh 12 or one or whatever and then and then just kind of like grind through it but then with 5 a.m it was like okay if i didn't plan for this then it's gonna hurt tomorrow so then i think the fact that it was absurdly early uh made me have to i think the night before i tried to wind down you know i stopped um stopped using uh like cell phones um as much uh going into like you know nine o'clock or whatever um started wearing my blue light blocking glasses i've had for probably like two years now i've worn them like twice um uh and just kind of like watched what i was doing like before bed and then made sure i got into bed by a certain time um so got up at 5 a.m and i think one caveat is getting up at 5 a.m but if you can get up at 5 a.m with a regular amount of sleep then that's like a that's obviously like a huge game changer (laughs) Um, so anyways, I got up at 5 a.m. and I probably had the most productive, uh, day that I had the entire week, um, by far. And, and it was pretty productive, like even in the first few hours, like by 10 a.m. I had already like worked out. I had saunaed, I had, um, I had taken a cold shower. I'd meditated. I'd probably gotten like three or four hours of, of like solid work done. And then it was like 10 a.m. And then people were starting to wake up. So that was my experience. And then, so the next day I tried to do it again. I got up a little later. It was, it was probably, probably about 5.30. I had a similar effect. Uh was obviously a lot more productive than I would have been. Um, so I did it. Uh, I did it again for, let's see, what day is it? Wednesday today? Yeah, I did, I did it again twice. Um, except for I'm kind of slipping a little. So it started at 5 a.m., then 5.30. And then yesterday was 6 a.m. And then today I got up like at 6.50 for for this podcast so it's actually a little hard to hold on to it um but yeah it was a great experience I, I'm, I'm i think i'm gonna try to wake up earlier because it's very noticeable that that's like um a keystone habit that kind of like because you're you're not like you know how we're doing the challenges where we're like oh yeah let's like stay off our phones or let's like do this and this um well if i got up at 5 a.m it effectively like all that time that I spent dicking around on my phone is usually before bed anyway. So you automatically eliminate all that stuff. And it's not like I'm going to be up at 5 a.m. Like, you know, watching TikToks. And then, so it fixes like a bunch of these other challenges that we're doing. So I feel like this one might, might be the one that takes it all, but it, it's the one that's the hardest. So yeah, that was, that was my experience. I love that, man. Yeah. And I've had, I've had streaks of doing 5 a.m. in the past. So I think, I think it's it's great to hear you get I think a lot of the conventional benefits 
Uh, I certainly experienced the same before. Not so much this time. This one was a little bit of a shock for me getting back into it. I'm not going to lie. Um, but you're right. It's actually really interesting. 5 a.m. is not one you can kind of like ease walk your way into right like the difference between 5 a.m and 6 a.m is like significant right um because if there's any buffer at all you know let's say you wake up at, if let's say you want to give yourself 15 minute buffer and wake up at 5 a.m that alarm goes off at 445 right uh, if you're that if you're you can be trusted to kind of ease yourself out of bed so um yeah for me it's it's just incredibly silent and I think that what's interesting is that like 5 a.m. It feels like, you know, when I was growing up and I was younger, I always I was the night owl, um, you know, like all my peak productivity came in those like, you know, uh, hours of the night. But, you know, obviously those aren't wasn't like the healthiest lifestyle to have. But 5 a.m. is interesting because I still feel like I'm kind of in that mode, like everything's just really quiet um you know with my thoughts so yeah yeah really good I think, stuff i think the night thing like getting a lot of work done at night for i mean that that happened for me too like all throughout college and, and everywhere else but i think that was more well a procrastination right so obviously um it gets pushed to the last minute and then so night just happens to be the time <laughs> that's that last minute um, but B also like at night when all your friends are like, oh, wait, uh, I guess I'm finished with all my work and you're like the only one left like late at night, just like typing away. Um, you are also less distracted. There's no one, there's less people to distract you and the motivation is there. I, it, it feels like a, a proactive motivation when you wake up at 5 a.m. Because it, it, I think the flavor is similar because when I wake up at 5 a.m., I, I do feel motivated in a different sense than I would if I had woken up like at even like eight, nine or 10 a.m. Um, so like that motivation is there, but it feels like a proactive motivation. I don't know if that makes any sense, but because the, the stillness of the night is still there at 5 a.m. The only difference is you're like well rested. You're like kind of like ready to go about your day. And I, I operate better in the mornings. Like my mind's much more clear, uh, like much uh, fresher just in general too. So. So you get all the benefits of that late night thing, but you also get the benefit of having like been well rested and then just kind of like setting the tone for the day. Yeah, totally. I think when I did 5 a.m. wake ups in the past, um, it was like I found it fairly sustainable. The only thing that challenged it was um, socializing with friends. <laughs> Uh, cause once nine o'clock starts to roll around, you start getting sleepy and I mean, heck you're sleepy uh, even ahead of that. Right. Um, and so when you have friends, it's pretty difficult, but, um, I'd be interested to check in with you later hack when we do more of this. Cause you know, I'm wearing my aura ring here and this is actually what kind of broke my 5am spell, like having more sleep tracking and reading up more on sleep stuff. Um, all of a sudden chasing that 5am wake up didn't seem as important um because uh you know quick summary a lot of your the most important some of the most important sleep that you have is in the later stage of your of your cycle it happens around 5, 5 a.m your uh your REM cycles um and also you know I would sacrifice like if I if like one side had to give right right like I wouldn't I wouldn't negotiate the 5 a.m. I would always wake up at 5 a.m. But then I would negotiate when I slept. So I felt like I was just chopping off like uh, hours. Like, I'd, you know, I'd have six hour nights, five hour nights, you know. Um, and we know that anything below seven is not preferred. So that's what I'm I'm going to try to experiment with again, I think, in this year. Because I got away with like 5.5, six hour sleeps for like a long time. And you look around uh a lot of people do the same but um i don't know exactly what you're giving up especially now with new sleep studies coming out and what have you so it is it is a hard balance but maybe it should be the 9 p.m challenge 
yeah yeah <laughs> I, I think we we talked about it last time i think and i think that by the way i think that it that's still that phrase is still salient for marketing like i don't think that the self-help circles have caught on to that like inversion but it's the kind of it's kind of it's the kind of cute inversion that they like to market right so it's not instead of it's like oh what time do you wake you know it's like oh i'm doing this 5 a.m wake up things like no i do this 9 p.m sleep you know like let's do that <laughs> let's make that it started here episode 30 9 p.m of the, so what the 9 p.m thing like i don't think i've heard it anywhere so nobody i mean yeah. They, yeah people do talk a lot more about morning routines than they talk about evening routines Mm-hmm. I mean, there's definitely stuff around evening routines, but I mean, like, there's like a book on morning routines that it's pop. You know, um, I feel like morning routines have gotten a lot more. Um, but yeah, evening routines are probably just as important because it kind of like feeds into that morning routine. Yeah, yeah, we talked about this last time too. I wonder. You know what? I feel like this. There's a book opportunity right here, heck. Like, write a book inver- on? like, like, what other things could we invert though? Right. Uh, and this is very much in line with, I think, the stuff that, um, you know, our friend Chris, who focuses on productivity, likes to think about. I think, like, what other things could you invert, right? Instead of saying it's the 5 a.m. wake up, it's the 9 p.m. sleep. Like, I feel like you could apply that, like, analytical lens to so many things. It's, it's harder to market, though. Right? <laughs> yeah. Because if I'm like, yo, 9 p.m. bedtime, <laughs> they're be like, what the hell, you have a bedtime? Yeah, that's lame as hell. It just That's sounds that. so much more badass if you're if you're getting up at five a.m. to get at it before anyone else is awake. Yeah, stay hard. Hashtag stay hard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should uh, we should probably start thinking about another challenge um, so that um, so that we can come up with it by the end of this pod. But um, it could be a nine p.m. thing. Man, that'd be annoying yeah. though, man. If I was like, "Yo, nine p.m. challenge," I'd be like, "Nah, dude, I'd rather do the five a.m. one." yeah right because i'm I'm trying to think of the shit i have to, have to eliminate um and it is a decent amount of stuff like it'll be like i don't know maybe i can't go play basketball with my friends or something mm-hmm. uh, and things like that where i'm just like huh i mean i could do it and still get about 5 a.m if i'm willing to sleep like you know just uh six hours and 45 minutes or something like that not terrible yeah, so like that's where. Do you know off the top of your head, like what, like how long like Kobe slept, for example? I feel like he's probably the guy that we're gonna check in often on this podcast. Uh, he just probably slept like, like what four was hours. He with? Co- that's Kobe, what I'm saying. That's Kobe what I'm saying. Kobe was at the gym first. Like he's he's like legendary for that. Like people will get to the gym at four a.m. to like beat Kobe there, and then he's already there like sweating buckets because he's been there since like you know like before four a.m. or something. Um, yeah that's absurd yeah so i wonder if so that's what i think about a lot um i wonder if i mean a part of what makes him unique is also like the genes that allow him to require less sleep you know uh you don't obviously don't want to take away from hard work and talent and stuff like that but i always like to think that you know everything here is (laughs) you know a lot of it is by chance a lot of it uh I wonder if he just needs less sleep, you know, so I might try to push that. It might not be the healthiest thing this year. I might try to see if I can get to five hours of sleep and see, track it. But like, I have to get my, my life super stable. So it's like a meaningful sacrifice, right? Otherwise there's, there's no point, but do you like polyphasic sleep? (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard not so good things about polyphasic sleep. Um, I was I was thinking about doing that at one point in my life when I was first getting into poker because I was like, man, this is not gonna last more than a year. I need to like just be playing like every like, all hours on end. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that would have been absurdly obnoxious. Like, there's no. I'm glad I didn't do that one. <laughs> yeah, I think I think like the regimen for polyphasic sleep apparently it takes like a few days to get your body used to it um so i forget if it was three days or like a week or something like that but something in that range and basically you're supposed to 
only sleep for 15 hours or 15 minutes, like every four hours or something like that. And it hurts to get into that regimen because your body's probably like, yo, I need to sleep. But if you force your body to do it, then as soon as it becomes and it starts understanding it's only getting that 15 minutes of sleep every four hours, then it just like you knock out like that for the 15 minutes and then you just kind of wake up. And then you're, I guess, theoretically, your body will slowly start to learn how to get all the deep sleep it needs and it leaves out all the, the light sleep or whatever um, in that 15 minute block every four hours. But then you're just awake around the clock. And um, I guess there there was people saying that uh, like some of the most productive people, like maybe like they were saying Lincoln or, or Ben Franklin or, you know, people like that used to do polyphasic sleep and that's how they got so much out of their day. I don't know if that's based on truth or not, but um, but I guess that was what I read on some internet website like in 2005. Um, but, but yeah, dude, glad I didn't try that one. Yeah. It, it, it makes me think of um, meditation practices. Uh, you know, I've heard of monks requiring extremely little levels of sleep because they stay in that meditative state or they regularly drop deep into it. Um, and it has like, I guess, a pseudo restorative sleep effect. So I think there's it's viable maybe not i mean 15 minutes every hour is extremely hardcore for every it's been a while hours, since i've yeah every four hours i it's been a while since i, I thought i re, uh, remembered polyphasic that's that's extreme so no i wouldn't fuck with that <laughs> that'd be interesting to get some aura ring data on that though yeah for sure for sure all right so that wraps up sleep um I thought that was a cool one. I want to carry that forward, and we'll, I think we'll check in periodically. Uh, any ideas for this next week's challenge, or maybe a, a rise as we go as we talk? No ideas yet. Yeah, let's let's let it rise up uh, as we talk. If we don't get one by the end, we'll just we'll just make one up. We'll do the four a.m. challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Um. You ever do you when you meditate? Do you get like? Does it have similar effects to a nap? Um, I don't know. I can't say. I think I meditate often when. I don't usually meditate when I'm when I'm tired. I meditate when like. I have, like too many thoughts or I, I can actually feel a phys physical like tightness in my my head is usually when I'll like instant meditate and so I feel very dissolved after I, f I do feel focused and dissolved and, and calm but um, not necessarily like super alert or anything um, you know there is a clarity but it's not as sharp I would say it's like a it's like a f warm fuzziness how about yourself? So sometimes um, I get like that afternoon crash and I'm just like, man, um, I haven't meditated yet. Wouldn't that be cool if I can just meditate and then like get past this crash? Um, so if I'm at home, like doing, if I'm if I'm like working from home, then I, I literally will never meditate. I'll just be like, you know what? My bed's right there. So I'm just gonna go take a nap. And, and uh, that's probably not ideal. Or maybe it is, I don't know. Um, but I haven't got myself to to cross that bridge yet. And if I'm like out, if I'm at like industrious or something like that, then obviously there's no place to take a nap. But the, there's all there's also no place to meditate. Or I guess I could go sit in a corner somewhere, but I haven't been able to get myself to do that yet. Yeah. So I was just curious because you were talking about how um, you know monks don't need a lot of sleep because they can just sit in meditation uh, for such a long time. But yeah, maybe yeah. I'll try that out this week. Yeah, I mean the theory is that they uh, they require less like sustenance in general, right? They they eat much less as well, just because their body gets more efficient. Um, and then there's some schools of thought that like essentially like put monks, like experienced meditators, like almost to the point of plants where they're just photo like literally just like getting energy from the sun. Um, 
and they're just like barely eating uh, which is pretty intense so i mean i think these are all documented things um which is why it's i think it's interesting where meditation is kind of inter starting to intersect with science or get, get a little traction there but i know that at least when i did my meditation retreat like um the goal is to get to the point where you don't eat at all afternoon uh like lunch is your last meal of the day um which, you know, we fasted, so it's not that big of a deal, but, uh, you know, that that is a tradition that, that goes back, so. They're very small. Their meals get even smaller, like, you know, so even if lunch is your last meal of the day, they, they start to eat, like, about that, that much. It'd be an interesting challenge. Not very, not one good for sports or anything, though, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, definitely not. Has your meditation practice changed at all? Like, when was the last noticeable change in your meditation? Um, so I've been working with a meditation coach, dude, but he's like kind of more like a, almost like a, a Buddhist uh, teacher, I guess would be the best way to describe him. So he teaches meditation through the lens of, of like the Buddha. And, um, a lot of the work that he does, I, and, and it's because it's interesting to me, like we kind of hop on Zoom and I think I, I kind of like went through like most of his curriculum. I mean, it's not like there's like, or like what he had initially intended to teach me. I'm sure there's like obviously like a, a whole lot more. Um, but then he just starts talking about like a lot of like Buddhist uh, philosophy type stuff. Uh, and he's teaching me that stuff now. Um, but when he was teaching me the meditation and then we, we, all, we always like touch back on the meditation to see how that's going. Um, it does, uh, he does give me like direction in the sense that it does have noticeable change. If I remember his, like, um, his, uh, I guess like his instruction, it's not like instruction as in like, like, Hey, like one, two, three, four. Uh, but he'll, he'll like, I think like maybe a couple weeks ago, he was, um, he asked me to, before going into the practice, um, just uh, try to contemplate on the, on the idea that everything is connected and everything is internal and just things like that. And so I'll go into my practice and think about that stuff. And I, I do notice that a lot of times it does have a change um, the quality of the meditation and the quality of the experience during like the 20 minutes I meditate uh, is much different or not. It's like noticeably different in terms of um, what it becomes after that. Um, he teaches, he, he teaches. Uh, so I, I think through the, through meditation for, uh, from the, from Buddhism's lens, there's like 16 distinct stages. Uh, there's four tetrads and then it's 16 stages. So there's four stages for each tetrad. And then um, it's like a it's like a path that you actually are supposed to follow, and like stage sixteen is like enlightenment, and then so you're supposed to like follow this like path to get all the way from one to sixteen. Um, I don't think uh, many people ever get to sixteen. Uh, that's not like a. Um, I don't think that's a common stage to get to, but. Um, but I guess because it's been taught over thousands of years, like there's, there's like this very noticeable path. And then, so he's like been teaching me that. So it's kind of cool to like think in terms of like a framework that's like been around so long, I don't, but it's tough because at the same time, when you're meditating, you don't know if you're doing it right either. You know what I mean? So then like you go and try to describe to him your experience. And he's like, well, I mean, it's not like I know what the hell's going on inside of you, but this is what I think. And then it's like his words. And then I go back and I try to do, um, I try to like self-correct or whatever, but then I don't know, man, it, to, so to answer your question, I feel like the quality of my meditation has in, increased, but it's not like, uh, I can't, I wouldn't be able to explain it to you in terms of like stages, like, oh, it went from here to here and then from here to here, but it feels like the quality is different than it was before. That's super cool. Um, 
maybe a tangent, but has he ever has he talked to you about <laughs> reincarnation or uh, karma yet, or has he wove that in, woven that in, or um, maybe the he I, I feel like he's talked about karma, but like it kind of like probably like brushed up on it on uh-huh. like the topic, but then like kind of like veered into like a different direction. But he's the type of dude where I was like, yo, can you tell me what you think about reincarnation? He probably have some pretty cool ideas um, <laughs> about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because I think he he's into like the. I I'm not sure why I got into meditation, uh, but there's like a, a certain. Um, for me now, at least, there's like a certain level of curiosity as to like, like what the hell like this all is in terms of like when i say this all is i mean like like reality the nature of reality or consciousness and like like why is why are we even here and what is like how did we even get to the point where like i'm experiencing like this like why 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 does this exist as opposed to like i don't know like nothing um and and what is this like consciousness and, and and whatever right and then so the most direct way that you can like observe something like that is by, or one of the most direct ways I think is through meditation. Cause you're just sitting there kind of observing your own consciousness to see like, okay, like, is it going to do something or, or, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like that curiosity that I bring to the meditation and that makes it interesting, even though I'm sitting there like doing nothing, because if you're interested in, in, and like what that consciousness is and you and you still your consciousness or sit as still as possible then you're like all right let me try to observe this thing as if you're like i probably sound crazy right now but um but yeah like you're observing your inner consciousness to see what it is and that's interesting it's like I mean, i'm not going to figure out what it is but i don't know so that's been popping around in my head during my meditations yeah yeah yeah, I think that's super interesting. Um, I think it's funny, even just now, you, you use the word inner consciousness, uh, but really it's all consciousness, right? Um, I think something that always trips me uh, and is great to think about is, um, you know, they a lot of the instruction is to uh, observe the present moment, right? like without judgment, whatever arises and whatever goes. And the number one rule of, of meditation or Buddhism or anything is that everything will come and then everything will go. And when I imagine like when somebody like appears in my field of view, in my consciousness, right? They are like almost apparating. <laughs> like they're not like you know what i mean like i know that they're there physically and all that kind of in sense but in the field of consciousness they are arising like like anything else kind of just arises like and that always trips me up a little bit um in a good way in a good way and in many ways when someone is not around right like any like right now there's like 200 people you know 500 people a thousand people you know hack that they're not in front of you so either like you know that they exist you know that they're they're safe and fine and well and they're doing they're probably just now waking up or something but they're not in your field of awareness in your consciousness right and so where are they right what are, what are they doing what are where are they are they what's what's the nature of their reality to you in this moment right um i think it's it's quite interesting and, and these things arise people arise feelings arise everything arises and just like you know you know i suddenly feel like my stomach starts to ache or like a headache comes you know like these things just pop pop and then they go it's super cool i think that alone is like really interesting um i know that for myself what has been interesting is the resolution of noticing has has increased um i one of my go-to meditation things is i and I mentioned it just now, like I always meditate when I feel like the area behind my eyes is getting a little too tense. Um, and just undoing it. And recently I've been practicing putting that, I mean, this is like where 
most 99 percent of people think that they are right they think that they sit in this stair or in this chair behind the eyes um and i've been able to like recently move that same sensation like to my elbow for example and make that the center seat <laughs> of my consciousness like right now all of steven is being driven out of his elbow or you know and, and, and kind of like putting putting myself in different parts of my body until like you know at one point i'll be looking out of my knee right Cause like uh it reminds me of the the one analogy where a lot of times people make this fa uh, fallacy they think that blind people see black right like you close your eyes like oh this is what blind people must see but they don't see they don't perceive anything they see what is akin to trying to look out of your elbow like if you try to look out of your elbow right now what happens there's nothing right and so that's that's a fun trick that I've, I've used to kind of undo my brain if you will <laughs> <laughs> trying to undo your brain <laughs> yeah that's funny <laughs> undo the brain. we're looking at my elbow <laughs> <laughs> right but it's funny because like even in a body scan sense like you, if you try to look out of your elbow all of a sudden you'll be hyper aware the sensations are on the elbow right a lot of meditation tells like teaches you to instructs you to like feel the temperature difference in the air right in that part of the skin um you know the moisture gradient all these kinds of things like if there's a itch somewhere on your body like itches are oh scr oh my gosh <laughs> i feel like every meditator has this like really tough relationship with scratch like like getting an itch in the middle of a, a practice and you're just like oh my god i cannot scratch this thing <laughs> i just have to observe it but oh gosh yeah. yeah i mean that brings up the topic of attention and it's um i mean there's something we said about like being able to place your attention wherever you want to place it that's like the that's like uh one way to control your experience it might be it might be like the foundational way to control your experience like you know you're you're putting your attention on your elbow but similarly wherever you put your attention that changes up your experience um like so much imagine your meditation when you're sitting there making your like you know trying to like feel out of your elbow or look out of your elbow instead of like from like this natural place inside your head um that changes things up but then like attention it's like you know sometimes you have control over that attention and you're aware of the attention you're aware that oh yeah i get to place this attention somewhere and you're actually intentionally putting it somewhere wherever you want it to go but then there's sometimes when you like just come back to it and you're like damn the, t the attention that i had placed was on that thing for like five minutes and i completely forgot that I put it there, it just got drawn there. And then it's like you lost the will, not willpower, but you lost your control of your attention. Yeah. Am I making sense? What, I mean, so let me, uh, so let, let me ask you, in this case, is it different from dropping into full awareness? Um, so I often use the elbow technique or whatever as a way of, uh, hitting full awareness right where there's you're just like you're not in any part of your body you're not even in your body you're just like the totality of, of awareness um but i definitely lose my attention sometimes too like like you know the focus so i think those are two different things and i was wondering um i don't know what yeah. you mean by full what awareness I'm, I'm i'm saying like you know like throughout the course of your day right Okay, when you're when you're doing the elbow thing, you're aware of your attention. You have control over it, and you're choosing to place it, like in a manner where it's like, oh yeah, like, like almost like a body scan. You have control over your attention because you're, you're willfully placing it to scan your body. For instance, you're like, okay, like, I'm scanning my body like intentionally. But then sometimes throughout the course of the day, let's say like you're driving your car and like you just zone out. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're driving and you, you zone out and then uh, at some point you, you you zone back in and you're like, oh, shit, like, you know, like, you know what I'm talking about? It's like you like when you get distracted on your phone and you're just like scrolling through, you're 
a lot of times your attention just becomes automatic automatic to this thing that that's like mm. you know cap that, that that has has captured it and um do you go throughout your day where sometimes you have like a similar quality of attention to when you're meditating where you're like aware and you're able to like place it in certain places but then some at some certain points you're just like not um not like present i guess would be whatever the would be a good way to put mm-hmm. it perhaps not present not uh being intentional with your attention like you're not the one in control of your attention in that moment um yes i i do and i find it very challenging to operate as both and i think that's where the mastery comes in um yeah you think there's people that could just that are always in control of their attention or you think that's just an aspiration i think that there are absolutely folks that are always in, in control of their attention um to use a one piece metaphor <laughs> right that i've used before to describe uh non-being um like to be simultaneously in a state of non-form and form right non-form meaning that you have uh non-form being that you've you've kind of tapped into this awareness that there is no separation right like the separation is stuff that we like the human mind imposes on things right it, it carves out edges right and it, it starts to sync with things as cause and effect um you know so the common common example is like you look at um a plant and a flower right uh we we separate that thing into dirt the microorganisms that live on the roots the roots the stem the leaves the flower and then the air exchange there's nothing about that that is actually separate all right when you map it against time we talked about time being a construct right when you map it against uh, physics like it's actually this one continuous system um with some arbitrary boundaries and so in in i think with meditation and, and with like a lot of these spiritual practices you start to undo separation that tends to invite um, equanimity and peace and composure and calm all those kind of things that you'd expect um but then to now continue acting in the world of form and separation in humans you have to be able to drop back in right and so going back to the one piece metaphor uh, there are these characters in One Piece. Um, you know, they get have all these special powers. You can have all sorts of special powers, but there's like a certain class of characters that have uh, elemental powers. Where uh, and they're super. They're, they're they're like super high class. They're like the toughest ones because what happens for these guys is if you like stab them right your weapon goes right through them because like let's say there's one character who's made of fire right he's he looks like a human he can grab a cup and drink it right he can do all of these human things but he's substantially formless right he's just chosen to manifest into this little human and so that's so that, that there's so much power in that right now the only time that you can actually like hurt these guys is one Hands, you know, if you have like the one power that like counters theirs, or you catch them off guard, right? If they know it's coming, they can make themselves like absorb it or cut through. But let's say if you blindside them, right, and they're not ready, and so that's like a big metaphor for me too. When like I can, if I, I meditate, and I let's say I have a really good morning session, and then I go back out into my day, I tend to be more in this like non-form state. I have to apply my discernment and judgment and and this is where you said like leverage my attention for uh for ways that I deem positive right to to not to actually act in in f- with as mo- much willpower as I actually have available to me at any point in time and not like 
just being susceptible to being reactive and stuff. Um, but if I like don't have my focus or awareness or something catches me off guard, like I can get taken out again. So, um, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I think to going back to your question of like, you know, losing your attention or being that like full awareness, not like non-focused state, but still pointing it where you need it to be. I think it's your 16 stages. <laughs> I think it's, it's gotta be one of those stages. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I would imagine. Yeah, that's interesting. The, um, I think you explained that pretty well, the idea of non-form and form and how like the mind creates a uh, separateness because the mind needs to have, like the boundaries in order to hold the idea in the mind. So you see like these artificial boundaries, because if you didn't see the artificial boundaries, you wouldn't be able to like convert that thing into a word so that you can hold it in your mind and think about it as a concept. But then because that's how the mind works, you have to undo that in a way to I guess like see or experience how things actually are but then you're kind of like popping between the two form and non-form because in order to operate as, as humans you have to be in you have to you have to understand the form and communicate in terms of form but then in order to experience things as that as they actually are you have to undo this automatic like machine that creates form so that you can like understand form it, it, it's quite a quite a little bit of a conundrum in a way you're like you can't well yeah it's definitely a conundrum yeah Don't i mean it's 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 like playing that video game right and i uh i'm not ashamed to admit that like growing up even even into my more old like into when i was a little bit older in my stages like sometimes i'd play a video game and i'd be I would I would completely think I was the character. Like the story would just be so good, right? And I just needed to beat this one boss and like, oh my god, and the reward was this amazing sword, right? And like I was like fully identified with that video game character in that moment, right? Like, oh my god, look at like, you know, my guy's such a badass, he like conquered this thing. Look at his big sword. But it's the difference between being the character trapped in that game versus being the person playing that character still having fun but knowing that it's a game right and and like knowing that it's it's all of this like made up thing um and that there's <laughs> you can play it and it get, keeps getting played over and over and over and over um and this is where it gets very buddhist right like people continually are logging out beating the game coming back in doing another playthrough you know, with a higher score or more completeness, you know, finishing the game, logging back in, um, and just realizing it's a game. Yeah, I mean, it's probably somewhat of a game. It's hard to say, like, um, yeah, the more you think about consciousness, the more you're like, huh, I wonder what I'm plugged into to experience <laughs> this thing. And then it becomes like, I mean, if it's such a, I mean, it's a pretty fucking good game. And yeah, those are, those are thoughts that make me not want to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was sit here and think about this shit for a little bit. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. And the idea of like, uh, let's say the idea of being in assimilation. I think the word simulation uh, kind of confounds it or like makes it a little, a little bit harder to, or um, I think in the past using the word simulation like uh, confused me in the sense that it's kind of like, well, simulation equals computers. So that means we're plugged into computers and then experiencing all this as if we're playing like a video game. Um, but simulation and video games are just analogies to whatever this thing is. Um, this thing being life and yeah, I mean, it would probably make sense that 
on some level our consciousness is like we don't know how it's plugged in uh but i mean that's the thing that is interesting like how like how how is this set up in a way maybe you're yeah. not supposed to figure it out like you're in you're in the fucking game bro like try to enjoy it like i mean that's what you signed up to play for right but then at a certain point you're just kind of like wait but you can do anything you want in the game so why not figure out what the game's about mm-hmm yeah i mean so you you kind of anchored me on this on the buddhist line of thought just because you mentioned you're a teacher um but the buddhist would say actually not even the buddhist i think actually i think all religions would say that the point is to find out um but you can only find out by and i'm gonna use buddhist terms here like burning off the karma that you were like born with or that you have and so um you have to go through it like whatever your individual journey may bring uh like you go through it but i think the ultimate goal is to to find that figure it out and if if not you right in this one run through then like the you that comes back for another run through um and then overall like the goal is to get the the overall floor the baseline of humans right at that higher level where they've they've broken through you know and just by the way one thing that helped me understand this concept in buddhism about reincarnation what have you is like you know like we always think about reincarnation from like this like western egoic point of view of like i have a name I grow up live a life and i die and like i can't fathom like me being coming back into this thing right but like that's the wrong first like n equals zero right for buddhists like for buddhists every single moment is rebirth like Boom, rebirth, rebirth, rebirth. Like every moment, every every cycle, right? Like this tiny little cycle here of like you and me, like, sh you know, shedding seconds off of every moment. And then, you know, then it starts to like macro itself out. And in this way, we are living like thousands of little lifetimes, even like through the course of a day. And certainly through every time you sleep, right? That's that's probably the closest thing to death, like a regular death that uh, that we experience um, day in and day out. And it's this idea that, you know, there was a hack of yesterday. He's gone, right? He was living out whatever karma he was living out. And now he's living out this, you know, another day. Um and so yeah i think there's a lot of compelling stuff in in the buddhist school of thought on on that if you can't tell reincarnation was one that as a skeptic and an like early atheist like i got and as the spirituality continued i was like what the heck i'm still trying to make sense of it and that's that's as far as i've gotten so far <laughs> so yeah reincarnation is an interesting topic and I guess thinking about life and death from the view of like a, a human, especially in the West, where like identity matters so much and, and the like that the the death of the self is as maybe not as bad as like death itself, but it's like up there, you know, it's like the destruction of the ego. Yeah, I want to look more into Buddhism, perhaps. I don't think I know enough in order to like have this conversation in a manner that, or the depth that this uh, conversation could go. But it is obviously like pretty interesting. And it's Hindu Hinduism and Buddhism. Is there a lot of overlap? Yeah, a ton, a ton of overlap, a ton of overlap. Um, yeah, 
they come from the same source. I mean, Buddhism came from India originally. Um, so yeah, lots of overlap. I think what's and and maybe yeah, and I think to your point, you know, it's it's worthy of saving for a future podcast. But I, we've talked talked before about being raised Catholic, and. I gotta say, probably the most one of the most significant breakthroughs for me in the past year was when I was able to connect everything from Buddhism and Hinduism back to Catholicism, and like my mind was absolutely blown. Like it was, it was such an easy match. Like that I could in the same in the same paragraph I could switch between talking about hinduism buddhism or uh, or jesus and, and christianity and it would be the, a, the same framework um so we're going to talk about that at a certain later time i think that'd be really interesting because uh my parents would be like what the hell and, you know probably slap me on the head it's like why couldn't you just list like <laughs> stay with this religion from the beginning you have to like do this world tour you have to do the world tour you have to do the world tour. Yeah. yeah, man, you can't you can't just not do the world tour. Yeah, that's the point. The point, or I think it is at least. You can't just take what's uh, told, or at least I, I probably wouldn't be able to. Um, but yeah, I think you have to do the world tour. Yeah. So, isn't that interesting? I think. I think some people have to take the world tour, and some people don't. But I think having done the world tour, you're like naturally equipped to teach, you know. Um, you know, I don't know about you. I, I see you, Hack, as a, as a natural teacher. And, and some people have said they, they like hearing what I have to say. And maybe that's why we're on this <laughs> darn podcast to begin with. Um, but yeah, like I feel like once you've done the world tour and if you can if you can put it into words and you can lean on like the fact that you've you've really honestly tried to excavate anything available to you um i think it it's it, it turns into a, a very like profound thing and, and maybe like people that endeavor to do what we've been doing for centuries have been the ones that uh update the culture framework right to update like to bring it forward carry it forward the torchbearers if you will like if you think about it because otherwise um like all systems need updating right all systems need to allow a part of themselves to die and all systems need to bring in the new and maybe that's what we're doing here that's an interesting way to put it it's like you have to tell the story in a manner that the people that live today can understand it. Um, because not everyone's going to take the world tour. Uh, I definitely haven't taken the world tour, I don't think. Um, you know, there's probably a lot more for me to learn. Uh, but, I mean, and, and it probably, it sounds like a worthwhile endeavor, though. You know, if you were, if you were the one or somebody was the one updating those systems. Um, I wouldn't even know what that would even look like in terms of trying to update that system but but you know i think that's for the person that's the updater to figure it out mm -hmm. i think you've definitely done a world tour, world tour like i often i often look back at where i was like you know certain milestones like high school or college or whatever you what have you in post-college and like and try not to take for granted just how far this spiritual journey has gone you know, uh, in terms of just compounding transcendental experiences, um, the reintegration that happens. And this is not to, not meaning to assemble any of this stuff into a hierarchy, right? To say that someone is like, you know, higher or lower, any of that kind of stuff. But there are people, yeah, like, you know, they, they mentioned take things at face value and can extract, use their judgment to extract the wisdom that's just been given there that moment without having to like maybe validate the entire framework you know um but you run the risk too of sometimes 
downloading some of the arc anachronistic old stuff right that's no longer useful um like i think religion is a great example of that right i think there's now now having done like quote unquote world tour i think i can see all the good in religion but that doesn't absolve it of all the bad stuff that's still out there um so yeah sometimes it can be hard to describe what's uh, acronistic and what's not because like i mean sometimes shit's there for a reason and it had you been the one that built that had originally built the system and you're like oh yeah we have to do this thing here because obviously we don't do this this shit's gonna happen but then you know somehow over time it hasn't happened in a while maybe maybe for some reason that we can't understand and then all of a sudden we're like okay well don't need this anymore don't need this anymore yeah cut this shit out and then <laughs> and then next thing you, <laughs> you would have to you'd have to zoom really far out in order to get that one um it's a very systems thinking mindset in uh -huh. a way it's like you move one thing and it and it affects another thing you had no you start thinking about like second third and fourth order consequences and you're just kind of like yo my fucking head hurts man i can't <laughs> i can't think about this shit no more so oftentimes uh people like to ask the question of like what makes me an adult right like what, what are the mo like who says that i'm an adult like i just i'm just a kid who has way like you know <laughs> it's way too much i would propose that what you just said is one of the milestones of maturity and being an adult when you when you realize that like the people coming after you don't fully grasp why this rule was put into place and you are the one that put it into place to prevent or to, like because there was a catastrophe that happened right and <laughs> like dude no 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 that rule is there because we didn't do it we didn't have that rule and then like you know uh jimmy fell and hit his head like <laughs> but you're just coming here to say that rule is stupid you know um Fucking Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. Like, it's hard to tell. It's so hard to tell. And I think that's that was uh, classically the role of, um, you know, sages and mystics and elders and what have you, right? Like, I mean, I mean, yeah. Like, the, the kind of to gatekeep um, those those rules and figure out what, what, it, what has... Like, it has to be this mix of, like, utility that's obvious and also like you know utility that's not so obvious um you know there's, I think another, for... there's another way bro you uh you make a list of rules and you call it religion and then you say never <laughs> fucking break these rules ever if you break it, you're fucking going to hell <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way you never fucking break these rules i don't care what you think or anything that happens you do not break these rules it's the bible god gave it to us <laughs> and then uh and then everybody just follows and we're good <laughs> yeah but if you put on these robes uh you get to break the rules sometimes just don't be too obvious about it <laughs> don't be too obvious <laughs> yeah oh god it's so true i mean but but it's funny like like separation of church and state was revolutionary like never at all in the course of human history I'm not gonna say never. Um, I mean, it's it's happened at certain times, right? But by and large, it's very like, you know, boom. This is when it like happened, like, because religion was the only way we knew how to run like this many people <laughs> all at once. Like the religion, like I mean, a lot of my friends who would often tell me like, look, the, man, the Quran is like super deep if you actually look into it. Like, there's prescriptions for like economic policy in there. Right. There's like a lot of things that pertain to maintaining a nation state um, that are very utilitarian in nature. And so, I mean, yeah, I think I mean, you're right. You'd have to enforce that with a, with a strict hand. Um, and I don't know, we're, we're kind of venturing into political ter territory here with this. But, um, you know, just recently, the. Uh, like I think the birth rate in America has gone negative, um, and it's a well documented attribute of first world countries um, that with wealth, um, 
birth weight rate negatively correlates, right? When you say negative, you mean like, um, like this generation's having less kids? Uh, yeah, or... we're not replacing. We're not replacing our old people, basically. So for every old person that dies, there's less than one baby that comes out. Yeah, correct. Is that happening in Japan? That's ha or... been happening in Japan. Okay, and um... it's starting to happen in the U.S.? Yeah, it's starting to happen in the U.S., right? Like, you know, and then, like, uh, that movie, Don't Look Up, just came out, too, right? Which is, I didn't, I haven't seen it, but what I hear, it's, like, you know, the 2021, 2022 version of Idiocracy, which was, big, you know, uh, big when it came out, too, as far as social commentary of, like, the decline of, of, of a first world country that's, like, just full of decadence and choice, right, and individual sovereignty, Um you know, not to be too grandiose, I'm not an anthropologist or a historian or any of that kind of stuff, but I mean, we do seem to be at a certain inflection point where there's just, there's just too much, right? Um, too much choice, uh, too much of everything. Um, and so, yeah, there's certain signals that start to come, I think, with that. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how we we pick ourselves up from it and and whether or not like you know this idea that the that the US is just naturally writing out its decline uh, will be also interesting to observe because um, I, don't, I don't know about you but like you know I, I I've read this idea this argument that like um, basically everything that America has benefited from in the last half century is because of World War Two, right? Like, we stayed out of the war, tapped in at the very last second, right? Built up all these factories and did, like, a full... That was the last time we, like, did full-on, full-scale, like, the every single citizen was, like, you know, geared towards winning. Uh, and then the whole world got wrecked. Like, you know, Japan got bombed twice. All of Europe got raised. And we had all of these factories that were uh, domestic that just got repurposed to like creating en enormous commerce and um, and yeah like it but if you think about it like what 50 70 years is a blink of an eye right um, all that all that wealth that we have so it's I don't know again not to insert doom and gloom or speak out of pocket but it, it does seem like we we just like are riding out <laughs> our uh, like our boom, as the boomers, uh, you know, start to sunset. That's an interesting theory, and it's probably it, it's like uh, you know when you play StarCraft or something like that, or uh, or when you play Han, and then like a battle has already started, and uh, and you're like on the other side of the map. And it's you kind of just rolling in at the last second. Everyone's like half dead, and you still have like your ult, and you still have all your, all your shit, and then you just merc everybody and level up, and, uh, and then uh, and then for like a, at least a few, um, a few rounds or a few minutes, after that you're like the strongest, you're the strongest hero in the game, <laughs> and you yeah, have all the best weapons, basically, and, shit. <laughs> and you're like loaded basically. with like resources and shit. Yeah, that was so here's good, a, good timing on our part. <laughs> yeah, really good timing. I mean, we were like notoriously isolationist. Like that's not up for debate. Like we, like we were way like that. You know, history always gets rewritten. Like we came in to like help fight off the Nazis because we saw like human atro like atrocities. Like no, we were like we came in. <laughs> we were like super selfish. Didn't want to go participate at all, and it just at the very end came in for other reasons. Um, and then we like re romanticize it to like us liberating the world like in some noble way so which something that's really interesting to, uh, another topic that we might talk about in the future which is a uh, like does does winning soften you right like does it just start a timer for like when you eventually fall you know um i know for example george st pierre the ufc champ right he like he like retired early 
because he couldn't handle it anymore. Like being champion for that long and having to show up every defense like title defense as a champion when everyone coming up is like hungry and young as hell but you have to like somehow remember the person you were when you first got the title and like keep that fire like that's a whole nother skill set which is why perennial champions don't really they're they're more rare than than you you know than ever because like once you get it you know like you got it right like what you, what are you supposed to do and then you know we talk about like our kids if we wanted to raise our kids with that type of humility and that type of hunger <laughs> like if we give it to them are they just gonna not be able to strive um any like what what's that balance it's like how do you know like is the fundamental premise that it does weaken you you know and that everything you do is is to to counter that and then how would we apply it to our own lives right like what do we you and i have too much of right now that is preventing us from getting to our next level versus kind of just staying where we are i mean i i do agree that like they say like the wealth like skips a generation or or um possibly because of that uh you know where like you know our parents worked really hard so we don't have to work hard and then we don't know how to work hard because we never had to work hard and then when it comes time to work hard we can't do it and then uh you know so that our kids might suffer for that but then they have to learn how to work hard um you know because um because we can't do it and then and so their kids don't have to work hard and it just keeps like going back and forth like that. Um, I'm not sure if there is a, um, there's definitely a balance for sure. I don't know what that balance is for kids. Uh, I would say I wouldn't raise my kids uh, as a, it's hard to say that until you actually have kids though, because it's kind of like, well, I want them to go to good schools. Good schools are in the rich neighborhoods, you know, and if you, and if you can afford that, you're not going to be like, well, you know, I don't want to, you know what I mean? So like, it's easy to say, it's easy to stay like sitting here, you know, on this podcast, but then when you actually have kids and like, you're not getting a lot of sleep because, you know, you know, the kids are like crying and shit all the time and you're dealing with all this bullshit. Um, and you can afford to like, you know, buy a nicer house and, and have an easier life for yourself, but also your kids. It's not like you're gonna it's not like you're gonna buy like a super nice house and then just live in it and be like yo you guys have to earn this shit yourself and just like i don't know put them in, a, in some corner somewhere <laughs> um but uh but yeah i don't know where the balance is man um i do think the way that uh that we came up uh kind of like like not lower class but not upper class either like kind of somewhere in the middle um it provides a good, like you learn a lot of this, uh, a lot of similar lessons that you would learn. I think um, you still get the benefit of working hard if you're like kind of like in the middle class where 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 like oh shit I want to get that thing but I can't so I have to work hard to get it. Um, you know, like I think even in middle class college isn't guaranteed like that you can pay for unless you're you kind of like plan for it and things like that so uh so there's yeah so i feel like the balance has to be somewhere in there and i guess you could also argue well if you want to play the game on hard mode and, and you know try to do it in lower class you probably learn a whole lot more but uh, but like you said like where's the balance i mean i'm not trying to play it easy mode but i don't want to play it in hard mode either so yeah yeah it's tough i'm sure there are a lot of parents that have perhaps solve this for themselves you know talking it over with their their spouse um it's not impossible right actually i was um so i recently moved back in with my parents and it's been a trip as i mentioned to you before hack like every day it's just been a trip oh and one of the things i've been doing is just trying to sort out as much as possible of my parents life my family situation um and a lot of that uh i've been talking with my sister 
like reflecting on our childhood and what have you and even though i think that my my parents and us we probably spanned the entire like spectrum and now up you know com- very 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 comfortably upper middle class um and i we had this one memory of growing up when we were in our elementary school my mom we lived in japan in this really cold like ja- uninsulated japanese home and my mom wouldn't turn on the heat uh just to save money and kim and i talked about how it felt like we were extremely poor but we didn't know it like we didn't like kim and i didn't know any better like we would wake up like shivering and then we would go to this little kerosene heater and like sit in front of it and i would literally like hang put my clothes up into the heater to warm it before i put it on and like that will never leave me you know ever and it's funny because financially we were very safe despite that right and as a kid i didn't know any better um but so maybe there's like creative ways to to instill that um but you know being 30 i think that's where you know the so what maybe coming back like i don't know how we carry that forward because i most certainly wait way more comfortable than you know i have any right to be you know where i'm at right now and i think about that often uh last comment before i go on because this was a really funny moment um when i was talking to my sister about it because I was thinking of a little bit about what my parents and my, uh, did to like give us this lifestyle, where they came from, and how far they've come, and and I was like, isn't it crazy how you can work really, really hard in one lifetime and change everything for your descendants coming after? You know, like assuming assuming optimist like being optimistic about it, right? Like if if my if we are able to carry this forward to future generations, it will all be because of one generation's worth of work. Like, like just my mom and dad doing what they did actually changed it for every single, like in one generation. And that's wild to me. Like not like two or three or what you would kind of say, like one generation of just like toughen it out. Yeah. But you have to be able to do that. Correct. Like, it's not a guarantee that we can pass this down to our kids because what if, you know, the fact that we didn't have to work as hard as our parents makes us worse parents. And then like, we have all these resources, but we're worse parents. So we're just like, you know, I don't know. I don't know what you buy kids nowadays uh, to spoil them, but we're just doing that. And then over time, our kids can't work hard and then they, they blow it for their kids and then their kids have to either figure it out or, um, you know what I mean? Like, the, and, and that's what we're talking about here. Like, how do you pass that down? Because uh, it's not it's not the material possessions you pass down. Uh, the gifts you pass down have to be beyond the material possessions. Otherwise, it's... Um, yeah, I mean, like, the material possessions, I mean, it helps you, like, get runway to figure it out. But you have to have enough struggle to understand that you are trying to figure something out yeah yeah we've come full circle on it and it's not easy um it reminds me of this quote by uh this sheikh who who kind of built dubai and when i went to dubai five years ago at that point i was like kind of interested because everyone hates on dubai and i was like oh but i don't know let's see maybe there's something cool with this place and i started reading up on it and one of the things that's really interesting is that like like five percent of their gross commerce came from oil um because the 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 guy who founded it was like yo we can't bank on oil and he has the, and you know that's why he pivoted to like a financial hub um and he has this like famous quote that gets uh, gets repeated a lot and he write he wrote um this is back in 1966 here it says my grandfather rode a camel my father rode a camel i drive a mercedes my son drives a land rover his son will drive a land rover but his son will ride a camel, right? Just like full circle, you know, to your point. Yeah, I think the gifts that you have to figure out uh, how to pass down are not the material ones, even though it's 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 nice to be able to figure out how to properly allocate resources 
to make it easier to pass on the real gifts. Um, like goal A has to be to pass on the immaterial gifts that your parents gave you. That has to be goal A. Um, and the material stuff is there as a resource to help with goal A. But if you forget that you're doing goal A, then uh, I, you probably shit out of luck, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's come up with a weekly challenge. I think we're coming up to the end of this thing. Um, All right. I would do a. All right, let me think. I'm just I'm just spitballing here. Some sort of meditation challenge. I'd be down to do. Uh, not sure if I'd be down to do some sort of hardship challenge, but I mean that could be a possibility too. Um, Should we give ourselves a, a weekly allowance and we can't spend over it? <laughs> um, let me think about what I have to do this week. Depends on how much that weekly allowance is. I have a couple things I need to do, but I mean, I could probably stay under it. It could be a food allowance or something. Yeah. Well, does eating um, at home count? Because I mean, I, I'm, I literally just eat at home most of the time anyways. I'll just have to eat at home a little more then. Yeah. I do spend obnoxiously with food sometimes where I'm just like, you know what? I'm at flower child. All this shit's healthy. I'll just get it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's potentially a hardship challenge. There's meditation. I'd, I'd be down for meditation always. Uh, um, Let's do a meditation one. I need to double down. All right. Um, should we do? I feel like it should be a daily one. Um, but uh, but we also do absolute minutes. Um. Mm. For the whole time and then like if you if you're like fucking up then by like tuesday you just meditate for the whole day <laughs> how about this oh. uh, you have to you have to meditate for as long as you spent time on your phone <laughs> so if you oh that's you, that'd be a good one um you gotta pay you gotta pay it's a debt like like every minute incurred on the phone is another minute of meditation just like every thing every donut you eat is like you know an extra 30 minutes on the treadmill <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I want to do that, but I don't know if I have the power to to uh, <laughs> that one. Uh, I'm trying I know, to think. That's so scary. <laughs> no, it does. Um, that, that's probably why we should fucking do it. Um, yeah. Because then it forces you to, to be like, do I want to be on my phone for a minute if I have to go sit in silence for another minute after? <laughs> does that mean that you? Shoot. Can we do a two to one ratio? Start this shit on easy mode or medium. Mode. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Two All right. So for every every minute you, I'm there trying to two minutes out. on social media, one minute of meditation. Is that okay? So any minute on your phone or or just bad minutes on your phone? Bad minutes. Bad minutes. It is okay. honor. All of this is honor system. Like you know. So. Okay. So GPS and stuff like that or Audible. Yeah. You, you can deduct that. But yeah, um, I didn't count those. Okay. So, so basically for me at least, it would probably just mostly be Facebook. Instagram, uh, probably Twitter or Reddit or whatever the ones that I'm on my phone yeah. for that, that, um, but you can do that shit on the computer, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, we're just waging war on the phone right now. Um, all right, this is what, this is yeah. what's probably going to happen. I'm trying to figure out how to game the system, but I'm not going <laughs> to use my phone for the first three days and just meditate a whole bunch. And then for like the last three days, I'm just going to be on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, how do I how do I beat the system? I mean, I'm not really beating the system. I'm probably just harming myself, but you know. <laughs> All right, meditation and phone challenge. I like it. Okay. Uh, we just have to meditate for more than when we're on our phone. Uh, two to one ratio for bad two apps. To one. Yeah, two to one for bad apps, right? So yeah, just divide it into two. Yeah. All right, sweet. All right. Um, I'm. A, we good to wrap this one? We are good to wrap this sleep deprived one. I'm going to go try a nap after this. Yeah, me too. Number Stop. 30. Stop recording.